Okay, so today I'm going to talk about some simple uh, nanotechnologies uh, for drug delivery applications. As you know, the nanotechnology has become a buzzword in the today scenario. Everybody is talking about the nano, nano, nano. So people are getting, you know, like frightened. What is this nano term, you know? So today I decided to talk on some simple, very simple nanotechnologies uh, for uh, drug delivery applications and hope after this presentation, some of you maybe uh, might be enlightened with this. Uh, you can also utilize some of these concepts or the ideas in your own research. So as we know, what is a drug delivery? And when we are talking about the drug delivery, it's different from the drug formulations. Drug formulations to the body. So it's just a formulation, uh, but the, when you're talking about a drug delivery, it's the next generation of the drug formulations, which works to enhance either drug absorption, efficacy, reduce toxicity, or the patient experience. Uh, so basically what they do, drug delivery systems control the rate at which a drug release in the body and the location where it is going to be released in the body. So these are the two things, the time, and the location it is going to control and some system control the both. So what are the main drivers for the drug delivery technologies? There are lots of drug technologies have been emerged recently. So mainly there are two drivers. Uh, so one is the molecule side. We are facing with the increasing challenging molecules and other side we have the increasing challenging uh, the patient uh, requirements or the market. So on the molecular side, we are having the pipeline full of uh, uh, issues of like viability, stability, targeted delivery required to, to reduce the toxicity, control drug release, and manufacturable challenges, especially for the proteins and the peptide bread drugs. From the market perspective, there are increasing demands from the patients. Now patients are uh, allowed to choose allowed to prefer the, uh, the uh, mention their preference. Uh, they want to reduce pill burdens. They want to include the, the palliability or test and uh, convenience is one of the most important factor when uh, which determines the, the uh, you can say the success of the pharmacotherapy. All right, so what are the challenges we are having right now? Uh, we are having some challenges I have listed here, but there are many challenges. Like we have the sustained release of highly soluble drugs. Uh, it's difficult uh, formulating increasingly water insoluble drugs. Most of the drugs which are uh, discovered, the chemical uh, molecules, they're highly water insoluble. So it's challenge to formulate them in the soluble, uh, challenge to solubilize them. Also to stabilize proteins and peptides, decreasing side effects and increasing efficacy of the current therapies, improving patient convenience. And we also look for non-invasive drug delivery systems, especially again for the proteins and the peptides. So what are the sol solutions to this uh, challenges? So I just like to quote Albert Einstein here. He said, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I had spent 55 minutes thinking about the problem and only five minutes thinking about the solution. But in the drug field, it seems that we have not spent enough time defining the problems, facing the current challenges for developing clinically effective drug delivery systems. Thus, many of us are prone to stick to what we are familiar with, even if they are not necessarily the best approach for solving the problem. So what is the common approach we actually uh, are following? So if you can see here, if you see the most of the publications which are coming in the drug delivery field, so what they are actually doing basically, uh, they, they actually just take one drug and they just fit to the different uh, delivery systems. Like one article came out of the drug of liposomes, other article will come as neosomes, third article will come as the microspheres, fourth article will be there as a sustained release. Or if there is a published article on one delivery system like liposomes, what the people are doing, they just change the drug and publish the same study by just changing different drugs in the same delivery systems they try to fit. On the other side, this is a very simple and common academic approach. 
on the other side what we are doing we are going towards more sophisticated and more uh, complicated uh, drug delivery systems so what we are doing we just innovate for the innovation's sake without having any tangible benefits in the near future for clinical uh, viable formulations and this is basically leading to the technology overshooting which simply makes more complicated without as i mentioned the, without any tangible new advantages or benefits for example here if you can see in this picture yeah, the same nano carrier basically targeting the delivery aspects targeting aspects uh, photodynamic therapy and uh, uh, targeting and so many imaging and so many things different functions basically it's actually very complicated systems okay it works well in the research or the small labs but when you try want to convert into the 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 marketed formulation it is going to be very very tough and very challenging which is nearly impossible and why we are doing this why we are following this approaches because of the increased pressure uh, for publications like either for the promotion or there is a lots of competitions peer competitions or peer pressure is there or mostly masters and the phd for students basically this this is this is a part of the degree requirements unless until they publish something they will not get a degree in a hand so this is the actually very sad actually that we are doing research just for the sake of uh, publications and without any tangible uh, benefits so what is actually needed uh, the innovation which we are doing by a drug scientist is to be accompanied by the intended ultimate effects that is the what is our main target is treating or preventing a disease uh, the problems such as cancers diabetes and other diseases recently there is a covid you know <laughs> it's a pandemic is going on it's only character only of innovation is translated into the actual products the throughout the world people are researching on the vaccines and the treatment options for the covid so so far we have seen how much success we have received and what i want to say here is clinically viable formulations need not to be uh, complicated structures and this i'm going to demonstrate by two simple case studies uh, uh, of my own research with my group uh, so one case study is on overcoming antibiotic resistance and the second case study is on cancer therapy from natural sources so uh, look in the time constraint i'm not uh, i will see whether i'm going to cover it both the case studies or will limit to one so let's uh, start so this is the case one the first study which we had done was overcoming antibiotic resistance so as you know the antibiotic resistance is one of the greatest threats to modern health and most of the bacteria are resistant to one or more antibiotics why because we are using it misusing it we are not completing the uh, completing the course uh, of the antibiotics uh, the level of uh, and complexity of the resistance mechanisms exhibited by bacterial pathogens also increase dramatically the world health organization has identified that urgent action is required at local national and international levels to ensure the adequate treatment of patients today and the preservation of the life saving power of antimicrobials for future generations it will be very disaster uh, due to this uh, it will be a big disaster you know if we are not come up with a new antibiotic it basically requires most of the antibiotics currently are are more or less uh, resistance you know develop the resistance so what are the main mechanisms uh, have we evolved in bacteria so which confer them with antibiotic resistance these are mainly three mechanisms so either they chemically modify the antibiotic the bacteria chemically modify the antibiotic or they render the antibiotic inactive through physical removal from the cell or it can modify target site on its uh, uh, cell membrane or cell wall so that it is not recognized by the antibiotic so as a drug delivery scientist i would like to focus on the second the mechanism which is the render it active through physical removal from the cell i can target this issue chemical modification i cannot uh, uh, change it 
if bacteria is doing something i cannot do it but it's physically removing from the cell okay i can do it something about it how i can prevent that so why it is physically removing uh, from the bacteria it's basically over expression of drug reflux pumps uh, which is the most common uh, multi drug resistance uh, mechanism this reflux pumps which uh, removes the drug from entering to the bacteria not only make the antimicrobial agents ineffective by expelling the drug it also leads to accumulation of mutation by exposing bacteria to substantially lower concentration of the antimicrobial agent so one viable approach is uh, to tackle this issue is to use the efflux pump inhibitors there are so many efflux pump inhibitors are available uh, but our approach as a drug scientist is to use the delivery system such as nanoparticles why because nanoparticles bind non competitively meaning the cells will still take up the particles even if they are saturated with naturally occurring uh, ligands that is mainly the the intake is occurring through the passive diffusion but here it is actively taken uh, it, it's basically different mechanisms it can take the endocytosis and other mechanisms are there through which the bacteria still able to take even though it is saturated so what we have done is we have chosen uh, methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus which is commonly known as the mrsa bacteria it's considered to be one of the 18 microbes listed as a multi drug resistance microbe or super bug this mrsa is known for causing skin infections in addition to many other types of infections and currently mrsa bacteria are almost always found to be resistant to multiple antibiotics so what can we do about this so we have the different antibiotics are there but we have mainly chosen this uh, three uh, antibiotics which are based on the chemical structure and the based on the availability at our hand also uh, so we have chosen the cloxacillin sodium ciprofloxacin and the leofloxacin now if you look at the structure of these uh, molecules basically leo uh, cloxacillin is an anionic charge drug ciprofloxacin and leofloxacin basically they are the m4 uh, uh, tyric in nature so amphiphilic in nature uh, so basically they having both the positive and negative charge depends on the ph of the medium now how we can incorporate these drugs into the nanoparticles so what should be the simplest approach so here we are looking at the charge of this molecule so based on this charge we have to select something now the selection of the polymer we require the polymer for the polymeric uh, nanoparticles so polymer must be you can say biodegradable and biocompatible in nature uh, biodegradable in nature also biocompatible uh, and uh, since these drugs carry the negative charge uh, we can use something cationic uh, polymer as we know cytosan or ketosan somebody uh, someone might you are calling so ketosan is a naturally occurring cationic uh, uh, linear polysaccharide it's only available naturally occurring uh, cationic uh, uh, polymer and it has it is been used in the different applications not only in drug delivery but tissue engineering so many different applications it has been used uh, in biomedical field because of so many uh, good properties like wound healing antimicrobial and again this antimicrobial property is important for us that's why we chosen we have chosen this uh, uh, polymer with anti inflammatory activities so now we have the drug which is the anionic in nature or amphoteric in nature and we have the polymer which is the cationic in nature so simply by you can say the by the charge interactions it is going to make a complex so what we have done is we have just make a complex of the drug with the polymer uh, cytosan at 1:1 ratio 
And we have simply used turbidometric meter of analysis at 540 nanometer to determine the turbidity of the complex. So here you can say the cloxacin basically it's it's a strongly anionic compound, so it forms the very strong lumps, very big lumps with the chitosan, which is not desirable for the nanoparticles. While leofloxacin was showing slightly higher turbidity around 40% and ciprofloxacin was showing around 38% uh, turbidity value of the complex, which is insoluble in water. Uh, so then we actually from this, we have decided to choose we uh, further work on the leofloxacin. What we minimum inhibit, we have determined uh, minimum inhibitory concentration, which is known as the MIC, and the minimum bacterial concentration, which is known as the MBC, with the MRSA bacteria. This is with the MRSA. So if you can see here, leofloxacin, this is the LF, which is a plain drug, leofloxacin. The MIC was found to be 128 microgram per microliter, and MBC was found to be 256 microgram. Since the chitosan is, sorry, yeah, since the chitosan also having some antimicrobial properties, we have also uh, determine their MIC and MBC, which was found to be 1026 micro, which is nearly one milligram, and MBC was greater than 1026 microgram. When we combine leofloxacin with the chitosan, uh, one microgram each, the MIC was reduced for, for uh, twofold from 128 to 64 and 64 to 32. And MBC also rose to one fold. There is a two fold reduction in the MBC was also observed, which was not sufficient enough. So then we have searched the literature and we found that the EDTA, that is ethylene diamine tetraacetate, which is a chelating agent, also having some antimicrobial effect and it also combines well with the uh, chitosan. So we have tried combination of these two, chitosan with the EDTA and the MIC was found, was 512 compared to chitosan alone. And when we combined uh, with the drug, chitosan and EDTA together, the MIC, the minimum inhibitory concentration was reduced to only four microgram. From 128, it reduced to just four with the MBC value of eight microgram which was a significant achievement in terms of the overcoming the antibiotic resistance with the leofloxacin. So to further prove these results, we have done the, we have conducted the animal studies. As I mentioned earlier, MRSA is also causing the skin infections among the other. So we use the skin infection is easy to uh, introduce and it is the less troublesome in the animals so we have chosen uh, what we have done is we have introduced the skin infection in the rats by saving the back of the rats mild burn was produced on the dorsal part and then which uh, they were infected with the, the that part was infected with the mrsa and uh, we divide them into three groups Control group without any treatment, we just keep the wound open as it is. Uh, one group was treated as a leofloxacin nanoparticles, uh, that is 0.1% uh, nanoparticles gel. And the, the third group was treated as a leofloxacin plain gel without uh, forming it as a nanoparticles. So this is the composition of the plain drug gel which is a carbobol gel, which is very easy to construct. And this is the same composition we have used for the nanoparticles gel and the concentration was 0.1%. And here are the results, these are the findings. So here you can see the diameter of the infected area in the millimeter. And here are the days of treatment. So on the day one, we introduced the, sorry, on the, on the day one, uh, on the day zero, we have infected the rats. We wait for one day for the infections to occur. And on the day one, we apply the treatment. 
So one group was kept as control, one group was treated uh, with the plain drug, and the third group was treated with the nanop uh, nanoparticle formulation. So here you can see nanoparticle formulation from the day one, means after the one day of the, the application, it significantly reduced uh, the infected portion or the diameter of the infected part. And after the three days of the treatment, oh, it completely, uh, the infection was completely disappeared. When you compare with the control, more or less the infection was the same. While the plain drug was also not very effective in this case, as you can see here, uh, because of the antibiotic uh, resistance, especially when when you're doing something on the in the petri dish or on in vitro and something which is in vivo, in vivo is basically more complicated and the antibiotics, uh, sorry, the, the microorganisms are showing more resistance because they're deeply attached with the cells of our body. So these were the significant findings in case of the nanoparticle formulations, the infected parts part was completely disappeared. And here are the pictures you can see here, the infected part. You can see in the control group, uh, the plain drug treated and the nanoparticle treated. You can see here, it's completely disappeared. Here, you cannot see the infected parts after the day three of the treatment. So the significant findings was fourfold reduction in the MIC and MBC by the leofloxacin, chitosan, and EDTA nanoparticles compared to leofloxacin alone. Nanoparticle treatment saw significant reduction in the diameter of infected area on animal skin from day one of the treatment compared to both control and plain drug treated group and complete absence of the infected area after four day of treatment. Thus, we conclude that the nanoparticle is a potential system in overcoming antibiotic resistance. And this is the one of the very simple and effective uh, you can say very easy approach to create a nanoparticle formulation. And this was published uh, in uh, International Journal of Clinical and Medical Microbiology. So this is the, right, the, the case one. The, another, another research we have taken was the cancer therapy. Cancer is also one of the leading co cause of the death. You know, it's the third uh, leading cause of the death worldwide. So we know that the plant have played important role as a source of effective anti-cancer agents. Like Peclitexel is the one of the one of the best example, we you know. Uh, and uh, currently, basically, sixty percent uh, marketed agents are from the natural sources, as we know. So what we have done is. We have selected the indigo ferrine tree cutter, uh, which was uh, identified as a potential plant with some anti infection, uh, so anti infective and uh, anti cancer activity. So we have chosen, which is uh, this plant is grown in the nearby desert area uh, of our place where we are working. So we have actually selected this plant and we actually done uh, standardization of this plant with the help of uh, my colleague who is working in the pharma botany and pharmacognosy department. So standardization of the plant was performed uh, by identification of the total S, acid, insoluble S, water soluble S, moisture content and the crude fiber, uh, which is required by the British Pharmacopoeia. We have also, uh, extracted the active excipients, which is the flavonoids and the polyphenolic compounds, which are having anti-cancer activity by the cold maceration process in ethanol. And we determined the phenolic and the flavonoid contents, which were extracted by following COCl2 uh, reagent. So after doing that, after collecting the extract, again, as we know, the polyphenolic compounds are anionic in nature. So again, 
we choose the ketosan which is the cationic polymer which is the best uh, selection in this case and we selected the we prepared the ketosan nanoparticles by just simple poly electrolyte complex or which is also known as self assembled poly electrolyte light matter so what we have done is we have take dissolved the ketosan in the acetic acid 1% acetic acid we have the extract here we have actually homogenized the extract with the chitosan and we have the chitosan extract uh, polyphenolic compounds uh, nanoparticles and which are further congealed with the sodium citrate by adding the sodium citrate which introduces the ionic generation and at the results we got the uh, nanoparticles of polyphenolic compounds with the chitosan then we did the characterization by the thin layer chromatography to find out whether there is any free polyphenolic compounds are present or they are all bound to the chitosan as a nanoparticles second we have done the uh, further confirm the complex formation between the chitosan and the polyphenolic compounds we also done the fourier transform infrared uh, analysis and lastly we have done the particle size and the zeta potential analysis of nanoparticles using zeta sizer all right just one there. yeah so this is you can see the size distribution so the nanoparticles was found to be around uh, uh, 500 nanometer in size and with the unimodal uh, distribution with the slightly some of the particles are the higher end but most of the particles are around 500 nanometer in size the zeta potential was found to be around uh, positive uh, 30 which is the indicating of the good stability uh, of our nanoparticles and the cationic nanoparticle charge is due to the presence of the chitosan which is a cationic polymer so after confirming the formation of nanoparticles and the absence of the polyphenolic compounds we have done anti cancer cell proliferation activity uh, in human breast cancer cell line i'm just uh, skipping this slide and goes to the results part due to the 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 time uh, issue so you can see here the cell viability which is the opposite of the mobility rate so you can see here with 5 mg uh, of 5 fluorouracil the cell viability was all most reduced to 10% of the initial value which means 90% mobility rate was the anti cell proliferation activity was there when we applied different concentration of the plain extract like 25 mg 50 mg 100 mg to 50 mg up to 250 mg extract we have applied but there was no much uh, cell death was observed we also applied blank nanoparticles as i mentioned chitosan is also having some of the the efficacy uh, but it didn't actually so it around 75 uh, 4% uh, it was observed cell viability was observed and when we applied 0.1 mg nanoparticles 0.5 1 and 2.5 mg nanoparticles means nanoparticles uh, uh containing 2.5 mg of the extract was shown to have the the highest uh, cell viability uh, sorry the, the highest cell death which is comparable to the 5 mg of 5 fluorouracil which is the currently marketed drug for the uh, with the anti uh, anti cancer activity so so this finding suggests that the almost 500 fold reduction that is from 250 mg of the plant extract it is achieved 0.5 mg which was showing the similar uh, efficacy in the extract concentration required to achieve same anti cancer cell proliferative activity when formulated as nanoparticles 2.5 mg extract containing nanoparticles showed similar anti cancer cell proliferative activity as 5 mg of which is half the concentration of the marketed drug and this results revealed that the traditional medicine plant could be an excellent source of natural anti cancer agents and the chitosan extract nanoparticles is a promising formulation strategy to enhance the clinical effectiveness of the plant extract so these are the simple case studies which doesn't require much sophisticated instruments 
to construct the nanoparticle and still we achieve the significant outcome and this article was uh, published in the current cancer therapy reviews lastly i would like to present some thoughts we should make a better environment for researchers to do their best work without worrying about the short term productivity no they should not come out come with the publication short term productivity means the publications part drug delivery is really multi dimensional research field which requires collaboration from different players like toxicology pharmacology medicinal chemists different players are required and it need not to be very complicated structures or delivery systems for clinically beneficial uh, formulations so with this i just like to end my uh, presentation with a famous uh, quote which says the research is to see what everybody else has seen and to think what nobody else has thought this is a place dubai where i work this is dubai pharmacy college and everybody i think most of you are knowing this burj khalifa which is the tallest uh, building on the planet and uh, i would like to thank you uh, for giving me once again i would like to thank you for giving me this opportunity and i hope you have received some take home messages from uh, webinar thank you so much